In the beginning, there was Richard Garfield. Not long after that, we got Counterburn. This deck has a legacy stretching all the way back to the very start of the game, and it's often one of the first decks newer players put together too, because it turns out if you put these two guys together, throw in a little card draw, you got a deck as unbeatable as John Cena from 05 to 2011. But to illustrate the dominance of Counterburn, you gotta shift that window back in time slightly to 1998, when Shard Phoenix pushed the deck into Type 2 viability. That's an old term for standard, just let me have it. And it would get even more irritating soon thereafter with the introduction of the torturous Squee for Bidlock, which I do not wish to relive, so I'll just flash forward to the early 2010s, which is when Isochron Scepter carried the deck for a full two years before it finally disappeared quietly into the night. It's been over a decade since then, and a once legendary deck is still missing in action, but is it truly gone for good, or is it merely a sleeping giant lying dormant until now? Let's find out. And I'm your favorite magic channel, favorite magic channel. Best believe that the professor go bananas for my deck tech. What's up, wizards? It's Dev and the chicken from the place we like it of magic. And chicken, did you know that Lightning Helix is back in standard? Oh my god! Hey, that's exactly what I said too, weird. Everyone's trying to build their Lightning Helix decks in standard right now, and we are no different except chicken. We are always different. You see, everyone's building Boros Aggro right now, throwing in that Lightning Helix, calling it a day, but I'm actually gonna go the opposite direction with it. But you already knew that, the intro spoiled that. But make no mistake here, counter spells or not, this is still a straight up burn deck with 18 different cards that go directly to the opponent's stupid goose face, if that's what you want him to do. And it all starts with four copies of Helix. Now don't get me wrong, aggro players, I see exactly why you're excited about this. It's a pretty aggro-oriented format right now, and being able to fight it out in the trenches a little bit, gain some life back so you can win the race and kill one of your opponent's dudes. It all sounds really nice right now, but I actually think what this card really does in standard is allow control decks to be able to get to their sweepers against all these aggro decks. And once we get to the example games, you will see that that is very much the case. So that's why I ended up going with a control deck is I wanted to try that theory out, but I was going to play lightning helix in the new standard one way or the other, right? But pro tip, just before I get off this card real quick, you can go ahead and get yourself a Lightning Helix from Murders at Carfax Manor or whatever you want to do. It's like 15 cents. It's a good price, but I think the better deal right now is the one that came out a couple of months ago in Ravnica Remastered. Got that nice retro frame. It's only 50 cents. If I was going to buy this card in paper, which I already have, I would buy this one, which I already did. But there are other burn spells in the deck, so let's go ahead and start burning through those real quick. We can't just talk about Lightning Helix all day. As much as I'd really like to, can we at least replay the clip one more time? <laughs> Memories. Now, they say that lightning doesn't strike the same place more than once, but that's an easily disproven myth given that we're playing four copies of lightning strike in the deck. That means we have eight different bolt effects in here to hit the exact same spot right on the top of our opponent's forehead. It's nothing flashy, which is kind of ironic given the subject matter, but lightning bolt is such a good card that I will gladly pay 100% more for it in my standard deck. I'm also on three play with fire because four is incorrect. I've seen some people on four play with fire and four shock, but just like your mom, there's got to be a better way to use those slots. There also have to be more more interesting burn spells in our deck to talk about. Luckily there are. We're playing two copies of Heart Flame Duelist because any more than that is incorrect. I was on four copies of this, went down to three. I'm on two, but I'm still playing it. It helps to have a almost Soulfire Grandmaster, like a, a part of Soulfire Grandmaster on the table against aggro, and it blocks pretty well from time to time too. I'm also on two Virtue of Courage here because I think that's the right number. Any more than that, you're playing way too many bad burn spells, and you're also playing way too many five minute enchantments you'll never actually cast. But in the late game, if you do get a hold of a copy of this, it can be invaluable card advantage. But our final card that can go to the opponent's face is kind of the most important card in the entire deck, and it's a card type that old school counter burn decks would have really liked to have access to. Let's play some Planeswalkers, why don't we? Three copies of Chandra Hope's Beacon. Yeah, three copies of a six drop Planeswalker. It's that important in this deck that we actually get this lady down. It's incredible card advantage later in the game, which a deck like this absolutely needs. That just card draw mode, look at the top five or whatever, is absolutely busted in a deck like this when you're looking for some reach, but so is her minus ability. This can blow creatures off the board while still hitting your opponent's face, which is something a lot of burn spells can't do. But you could argue the most important thing about the Lady in Red is that she doubles up the first instant or sorcery that we play every turn by copying it. So you get 12 point life swings off of lightning helixes or whatever, and just a lightning strike is still six damage to the face over a quarter of the opponent's starting life total. So that adds up pretty fast. But since Planeswalkers are like legit, like so powerful in counter burn decks, it turns out, I'm also on two copies of the Wandering Emperor here. Because why not? Again, I don't think that any more than this are really necessary, but, you know, you're a 
burn deck. One of the big problems with burn decks is that they can't really take out like the fattest dudes on the table, but this will help you do that and gain you back a little bit of life, help keep you in the game. But other times it's going to create threats or blockers for you. This also works on a bunch of different levels and they're all levels a deck like this enjoys. We're a control deck. Let's play some Wandering Emperors. But these Planeswalkers aren't going to protect themselves and more importantly for a deck like this, we got to save our burn to go to the face if possible. So let's play some sweepers in here, starting with four copies of Sunfall. You probably saw that coming. There's a reason that every control, even approaching control deck in the format, plays three to four copies of this card. It's just one of the most bonkers sweepers that we've seen in years. And it's one of our only hopes in a meta this fast, you know? When you encounter a board state like this, where the opponent has an 8-8 rabbit and a 4-4 guy that just got convoked out, and they have a Warden of the Inner Sky that's getting huge, and like 12 other dudes beyond that, you need a Sunfall to help temper those situations, keep you in the game. But I'm not done with sweepers in this deck. We're also on two main deck copies of Brotherhood's End. That is how prominent aggro is in the format right now, but this actually works on a couple of different levels beyond just being an early game sweeper, which it is awesome at doing. But there's a bunch of decks in the format right now. You might actually get some real work out of that second mode on it for the first time in a while. But wait, Deb, wasn't this supposed to be a counter burn deck? There's counter spells in here somewhere, I assume. Yeah, there are. There's three copies of No More Lies because again, four is wrong. I swear to you, <laughs> I played with four copies for a good bit of my testing here and one would just kind of sit in my hand, especially if I had multiples like far too often. And it is a new Mana League, but people forgot that one of the problems with Mana League is that it's not anywhere near as good on the draw. So that, that problem persists here. And I don't think you need four copies in your deck, but three is plenty to counter the big spells that matter the most. And besides, we're a best of three deck. We get to play counter spells in the sideboard if we want to. And we got a few in there. So if you really need counter spells, you can always wait until games two and three to really utilize those. But in your main deck, you've got three very strong counter spells. And yes, I should mention it. The fact is Exiles the spell is like so super important in the current standard. But the last piece of the puzzle in this deck is some card draw. We gotta get some fresh cards in our hand, you know, because if we run out of cards, we don't have any cards and we're a control deck. That's super embarrassing. So let's play one copy of Celestis to kind of kick off the card draw on the deck. Yeah, this does filter. You have to pitch a card to whatever, but still, important for a number of reasons here. Not only is this going to get us fresh cards when we need them and pitch bad cards or whatever, but it also ramps us into a turn four sunfall on occasion, and that is a pretty important function. It can also ramp us into the Chandra, which is kind of important. We get a little bit of life off of it. It's easy to cast in our three colored deck. There's a lot of pluses for playing one Celestis, but I don't think you need any more than that either. So we're going to move on to the two copies of Big Score that we're playing in the deck. Again, you don't want to just be discarding all the cards in the world, but big score is really important here because just like the last card, it can help ramp us into a Sunfall on the next turn without having to draw a land or more often a Chandra on the next turn. All while getting you fresh cards too. Like there's a reason big score is in every deck with mountains and it's like $1.50 for a common right now. It's just a really good magic card. Play it in your decks if you can, but we got a couple of slots left for cards that draw cards in this deck. And I had a few things I wanted to try out. You know, I'm excited about Silver Scrutiny. I was excited about Memory Deluge, which I still think might be better than the card we ended up on to be quite honest. But I wanted to try a bunch of new stuff out here and I was not disappointed at all in Intrude on the Mind. Altogether, I just wanted like another actual threat, like another real way to win the game in the deck outside of just Burn and Chandra over and over. And this will give us that extra bit of dimension that we need. Sometimes we're just going to play it on our opponent's attack step and like either chump block or trade the Thopter with something, right? And just get cards off of it, which is all we ever need. This deck wants fresh cards after fresh cards after fresh cards. That's all it wants. So if that's all this card provides, that's great. But getting the body is awesome too. Now here are your lands, 26 of them. We are a control deck with six drops. So let's do that. There's 17 red sources, 16 white sources, and 13 blue sources, which doesn't sound like a whole lot for cards like Intrude on the Mind. But remember, we've got Celestis and even Chandra to help fix our mana. Now let's take a quick look at our sideboard. And there's the counter spells. I'm playing just one negate and two disdainful stroke. You could switch these numbers around. I would rather stroke than negate, whatever that means in the current format, but we've also got a bunch of removal so we can deal a little bit more, even more, one would say, against aggro decks. We've got two copies of a braid as well as a get lost to start off the two mana removal in the deck. Now, a braid looks a little bit weird, especially when we could be playing like destroy evil in a slot like this, but I've gone with get lost 
over the destroy evil because we need to be able to take out planeswalkers. You would think the burn would help, but it usually takes two burn spells to take out a planeswalker. We don't like that. A braid goes back to what I was saying earlier about subterranean schooner decks with spyglass siren and case of the filched falcon and novice inspector and like all of these early game artifacts a braid's nice especially against cards like subterranean schooner and they are more prominent than ever aside from that lithomantic barrage is maybe the most important card in the entire sideboard because the absolute worst thing that can happen to us in the entire fair st standard environment at the moment is our opponent gets to go first and on turn two they actually convoke that 4-4 knight Aaron of eos they get that guy on the board on turn two way too often and there's just not a whole lot that we can actually do about that. Lithomantic Barrage can kill that guy for one mana, and just being able to do that means we win way more games. But just when you thought you were dumb with sweepers, you are never dumb with sweepers. This is a control deck. We play a few of those. So I'm going to show you this one copy of Farewell and two copies of Cutsel's Flanker. Why did I put these two cards together? That's weird. Well, Farewell is multidimensional. If we're having a problem with different permanent types, this will help us get rid of those. Exiles creatures, obviously, but Exiles graveyards, importantly. That's important against a bunch of decks right now. But, of course, I should admit that all the decks it's good against will probably do their big game play before we get our farewell. So that's why we're playing the two Custles Flanker. Exiling someone's graveyard for three mana means a lot in a format where, say, the Helping Hand deck, the Azorius Helping Hand deck, is becoming more and more popular by the day. The Soltai Squirming Emergence deck is becoming more and more popular by the day. The Insidious Roots deck is becoming really popular. So it's a really important thing to have right now to be able to exile their graveyard so they can't do that ridiculous thing they want to do because the stuff they want to do is admittedly ridiculous but we're not quite done with the board we're playing two copies of chrome host seed shark to finish it off here now you could make an argument for wedding announcement which is what a lot of control decks are going to play as a three or four of in the sideboard and pretty much exactly this slot for exactly the same purpose but a chrome host seed shark flies b we're playing like 32 non-creature spells in the deck to trigger this so that should be pretty good. Again, if you're just looking to protect your planeswalkers or fight in the trenches against other decks, Wedding Announcement probably is the better card, but we do those things somewhat well enough already, so I'm using Chrome Host Seed Shark as kind of another threat to bring in when they take all the removal out. Now, there are some cards you definitely want to consider if you build this deck. I did. Things like Sacred Fire and Stoke the Flames, but like I said towards the top of the video, you don't just play like four shock, four play with fire, four every single thing that hits the face, regardless flames, whatever. You, what are you doing? You don't necessarily do that in a deck like this, and you could. Maybe it'd be a whole lot of fun, but that's just not the direction we went. We had precious little slots for burn spells, and we still somehow worked 18 in. Aside from that, though, the big spicy card that I would add to this deck if I wanted to add more cards to this deck is Arcane Bombardment. This could theoretically be a better 6-drop than Chandra, but I don't quite think so. But if you can untap with this on the board, then obviously you can just start winning the game from there. It doubles up on spells too. But hey, Chandra kind of does that as well while also doing a whole bunch of other stuff. So again, I just think Chandra's the better card. It's kind of harder to deal with right now. Not everybody's packing you know, Planeswalker removal in the main deck, but everyone is packing Destroy Evil, it seems, or Tear Asunder or something like that. So again, I think Chandra is just the safer play than Arcane Bombardment, but Arcane Bombardment is uh, admittedly a ton of fun. We've all played this card before and had the time of our lives. Now here are your power rankings. A final score of 69. I hate to do the meme, but that actually is like a pretty nice score around here. You know, 69 is kind of at the upper level of what decks tend to score on this channel, but this is an undeniably very powerful deck with some small amount of synergy, although not an over-the-top amount, but more than a control deck would usually get. It's got a lot of varied ways to protect itself, so you see high scores in both versatility and defense. The card draw and some of its different dimensions like its Planeswalkers are what gives it that little bump over the 5 mark in resiliency, and most notably, this deck is far better in Game 2 than it is in Game 1. I could talk about this deck all night, and believe me, I literally could, but I think it's more important that I show you how good this deck can be. And points to me, I can unlock achievements if I can show you how good Lightning Helix specifically can be in this format against a scourge of a deck, and actually show you a game where I burn the opponent out. I think I can do both of those things in our example game, so let's go ahead and get to them. Now in this first game I want to show you, we are on the draw against Mono Red, which can be a dangerous situation to be in, I know, especially when you have to start on tapped land, but I think this game is really illustrative of how good Lightning Helix is in this new format and how much it helps us get to important sweepers and important flashpoints in the game. Now, as I've been saying all these words to you, our opponent has already played Phoenix, Chick, Kimana Faces, Kakazan, and played with Fire to the Face, but we get to Lightning Helix, the etchings of Kumano, despite the good start from Mono Red here. They have yet another 
Kimana Vases Kagazan, just to hammer in their good star. But we are going to pass turn on turn three after playing a land here, and our opponent is going to start getting in with Mishra's Foundry, which is actually exactly what we want because there's no better target in the entire deck than Mishra's Foundry for a Lightning Helix. So that is Helix number two on the game, and I want you to remember that. It'll become important later. Our opponent Monstrous Rages their Phoenix Chick, gets in for five, and we are at 13, which is actually a pretty good life total for this point in the game against Mono Red. They're gonna come in, we're gonna practice some discipline and not kill these guys with a lightning strike. We wanna save that, but we will know more lies, the etchings that they tried to play right there. So we won't have to deal with any creatures after this Sunfall. We rip it off, get our incubator token, and they have a Sakenzin to finish off their hand. That puts us at six. Remember, we cast two lightning strikes. We should be dead right now, but we're not because we gained all that life. Opponent gets in, we activate an incubator token, block one of the dudes again, stay as disciplined as we possibly can here, and go down to five. We hard flame duelist their face, disrespecting the token, then we have options this turn. We can just block with the bivouac if we want to, but we end up just playing the wandering emperor to completely crush their spirits and finally end this game against mono red. Now in game two, we are on the draw against aggro again, but this time it is the feared, the terrifying Bant Toxic deck on turn one on the play venerated Rod Priest. So again, I wanted to give you games that seem tough for us to win. I feel like this is a great illustration of that. Even they get job on Duelist on turn two, but they tap out to do that. So we get the Lightning Helix, their venerated Rod Priest away. Even so, they have a Skrull to play to the board. So. Since they can't use that scroll this turn and all they have is Mirax, we decide to again Lightning Helix main phase and get rid of this Jawbone Duelist. Now we are on four poison already, which is kind of a lot despite all of the removal. Our opponent's gonna waste their turn with Takasi's Welcome and get in with the scroll. That's gonna be a poison to us. We're halfway there already, but in a pretty good situation in terms of where we are on the board. We are gonna Wandering Emperor this scroll, but we're not gonna use the Exile mode. We're actually just gonna make a creature that prevents us from having to target it with anything, which the Bant Toxic deck is pretty good at having their stuff targeted and then countering those spells. So we'll just make a 2-2, block the Skrelv. They're going to tap the Seed Core and end up trading, which means they're not going to be able to do much more on their turn. We're just going to make a 2-2 and pass turn on our turn. We hope to big score here or perhaps cast No More Lies or perhaps cast a removal spell. We consider the No More Lies against the Annex Sentry. Decide it's a bad idea. We just want a big score EOT so that we can get this Chandra down. We discard the Brotherhood's End of all things, which ended up being the better decision anyway because we play all the cards in our hand at this point. We play the Shiv and Reef to the table, get the Chandra down, and then end up hitting the opponent's face and their sentry for four at the same time, so we can go ahead and get this burn train started. Now, that's gonna put our opponent at 15, and we just get to plus zero or plus one with the Wandering Emperor submitting zero. This is an important turn for the opponent, but they can't do anything with it despite all the cards in their hand. Now we just add mana to our pool with Chandra, adding Lightning Helix mana, doubling up the Lightning Helix with Chandra's passive ability. That's gonna put them at nine right there. And then we're just gonna unload on them. Lightning Strike to the face, that's gonna be six. We try the Heart Flame Slash, they're gonna try to counter that. We can no more lies that, and even though you could argue that I should have waited until their turn to cast some of these spells, getting another double up trigger on Chandra. The opponent still knows they're in a dire situation here. They're dead on board to Chandra. They can't do anything about it, so they're out of the game. Good game opponent, but that is it for Big Jessica. Just let me know how you felt about this one down there in the comment section, how you'd build your deck. I think pretty soon on Twitch, I won't be playing this, but I will be trying out the deck I've been kind of making fun of the entire time where I just play like four shock, four play with fire, four regatta flames or whatever it's called, four stoked the flames, four lightning helix. Just play all the burn lightning strike in the entire format. See how that works. I think I want to stream that. So if you're interested, checking me out on Twitch, link in the description. There's also a link down there to Patreon, which is the only reason I'm still doing this. I'm holding this microphone right now because of the sponsors of this video, Patreon members, people like 1-800-CALL-CTHULHU, which sounds like an actual business that's sponsoring the video, but it's actually just my newest patron. Thank Cthulhu for this video. To be honest, you should probably already be thanking Cthulhu for every video, but anyway, make sure you like the video. That'll put it in more recommended feeds. Let's get this thing, let's get this thing going. You can also subscribe to the channel if you haven't done that just yet. I'm trying to get to a million subscribers before the professor. Now he's within like 50,000 and we are within 800 and 70,000. So it's going to be it's going to be a trek, but I know we can get there first. We just got to get people subscribing at a pretty fast clip. So if you haven't done it yet, go ahead and subscribe. I wonder if this will work. 
I like the professor, by the way. I got nothing against him. I just want to, I just thought it'd be a fun joke. Get me there before him. Do it. You can, you guys can do it. A, a million people will watch this video. If you all subscribe, we'll get there. But yeah, done ski for this one ski. Just do all the YouTube stuff. And if you want to, you can keep watching my videos. We just released this new coffee break. It's got all the coolest combos from Murders at Karlov Manor, and it's all smooth. Got the coffee break voice like you like but we've also got another deck tech we did this season we started it off with gruel and zrag and that's a really good deck too so if you want more content check it out maybe youtube will just shuffle it in for you in the next video but in case it doesn't you did want to see those you can just check out the description i'll leave links to those too but it's basically all ski kowalski and i don't want to talk your ear off all day i got a lot of work to do around here i got to do like the Ways I spent five, the, I spent five dollars on Murders of Karlov Manor. I got to do like the best new decks in the format due to tournament data and stuff like. That. I got a lot of videos to do here in the next week. So uh, happy Valentine's Day to you, by the way. And I will catch you cats later. I'm Deb from the place. Thanks for watching, Wizards. Spread love, and be kind.